Welcome to this Mitigating and Authorized Scraping Alliance webinar. My name is David Pataryu, and I'm a privacy law specialist and technologist with Venable LLP and a legal advisor for Musa. Our topic today is cross-border data flows, data protection, web scraping, artif and artificial intelligence, focusing on the European Union and the United States. We'll examine the key tensions and their implications at this intersection of these critical topics. Today, we are grateful to be able to discuss this topic with Professor Alex Joel, He's a scholar in residence and professor at the Washington College of Law. Previously, he was a senior officer with the Office of Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI, where until June 2019, he served as the chief of the Office of Civil Liberties, Privacy and Transparency, CLPT. The CLPT works to ensure that the intelligence community carries out its national security mission in a manner that protects privacy and civil liberties and provides appropriate public transparency. As chief of the CLPT, Mr. Joel was the ODNI's Civil Liberties Protection Officer, a, petition, a position established by the Intelligence Reform and Terrorist Protection Act of 2004. Mr. Joel served in that position since the ODNI stood up in 2005. Since 2015, Mr. Joel has also served as the ODNI's Chief Transparency Officer, appointed to the position by the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper. Mr. Joel formerly served on the board of directors of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the world's largest association of privacy professionals. Previously, Professor Joel worked as an attorney at the Central Intelligence Agency's Office of General Counsel. Before that, he worked in private practice as a technology attorney at the law firm Shaw, Pittman, Potts, and Trowbridge in Washington, D.C., now known as Pillsbury Winthrop, and as privacy technology and e-commerce attorney for Marriott International. Professor Joel began his legal career as an officer in the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps. That was a lot to get through. Thank you so much for being here today, Alex. Thanks for having me. And I, it, it makes me feel old to hear have you read that that bio. I have to shorten it just to just for my own self preservation here. So maybe I'll remove the dates the next time. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, I feel the same way when people look at my bio. But uh, but uh, great to have you here today. And uh, uh, just to kind of give a ba little backstory, we first met in Brussels when you were talking at the IPP and discussing data transfers and the new uh, data data court, data protection court. Um, and I thought it was such a great talk. It was the last talk on the last day of the conference, and it was a pretty full room, all things considered, in Brussels. Uh, and we met again at the airport, and I said, hey, would you please be willing to be in this webinar? And here you are today. And so thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate and, to, and educate our uh, users and audience about data transfers and how uh, they relate to uh, unauthorized web scraping. And we're also hoping to talk a little bit about the recent um, uh, Bright Data uh, case against uh, that X brought against Bright Data, a scraping case in NDCal that was decided about a week ago. And so hopefully we get to talk about that at the very end of all this. Um, so do you have any opening thoughts or um, just in general? I mean, I think when we were talking before, we, we kind of wanted to touch on a little bit about what data transfers are, why it's important, and why we have some of these protections in place, and why, you know, there's an interest to be able to see what's kind of going across the wire to prevent uh, acts of terrorism in our com in our country. Um, is that is that kind of a good overall summary or... Yeah, I think so, David. I think I think all of these issues are 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 coming together. There's a there's a huge amount of convergence um, when when different legal disciplines are now dealing with the issues uh, that the world faces today. I mean, I think it used to be that you have um, silos of legal expertise, and you were an intellectual property attorney, or you were a litigator, or you were. Uh, maybe you know, back in the in the in the in the days where I first started doing this, privacy was was still brand new. I mean, I was at Marriott when the International Association of Privacy Professionals was first created. So it it's it's all it's all relatively recent that these that these uh, that these disciplines have have really become uh, are converging, are coming together, and we and we see this with data flows, with web scraping. Um, and in that opinion that you just cited, that that uh, that that X Corp case, uh, bringing together copyright law with state uh, trespass law, et cetera. So I don't think lawyers can can comfortably stay in a silo anymore. We have to really uh, be very aware of what's happening internationally as well as at home. 
how national security and law enforcement access to data works and how that impacts uh, companies' ability to do business on a global scale because of distrust or misunderstandings um, across the Atlantic, et cetera. So I think I think it's a fascinating topic and one that we could talk about for for days. I, I agree. I mean, I think when I was, I remember when I was in house, you mentioned experience at Marriott. When I was in house at Yahoo and Instacart, you know, there was always the, you know, well, how do we deal with data transfers? And it was so, it's such a, it's it's tr tricky because the law has changed quite a bit. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Schrems, who's been doing a lot of work in that area and uh, knocking down each uh, framework or regime as it comes up. And I, I mean, I think it's important for the audience to understand that uh, the reason companies have to do data transfer, sometimes there's uh, subsidiaries in different parts of the world, but yet the architecture or the service is based in the U.S. or based somewhere else. So you may have, for example, an email service, the servers, the processors, the things are sitting here, and it doesn't make sense for a company to stand up a whole new instance of all of that software, hardware, everything else in a different jurisdiction. So what they'll do is they'll still provide the service, but they rely on the data transfers to kind of bring the data back and forth between the users and the foreign jurisdiction. So it could be Europe, could be Asia, could be LATAM, could be Canada and US. And so um, as opposed to replicating that, that architecture, that service and storing data locally. Um, and so I'm sure you've seen a lot of that too, where, I mean, maybe your experience at Marriott where, you know, you may have systems and stuff that are sitting in the U S uh, or that, and you're not replicating those all over the world. So there's that need for this ability to move data back and forth between entities. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're all inherently uh, uh, global at this point because of the way that technology uh, interconnectivity has brought everything so much, so, so, so much closer together than it was before. I mean, you can even see this in the terminology. When I was at Marriott, we entered this the so-called safe harbor, which was the arrangement that the uh, Department of Commerce had put in place with the European Commission at that time um, to enable U.S. companies to comply with uh, the data, what, what was then the Data Protection Directive. So the European Union's uh, way of protecting personal data required that uh, other countries be found to have an adequate level of protection so that they could process data collected inside the European Union, they could process it in a country that was not part of the European Union. And at that time, that arrangement, as you know, was called uh, the safe harbor. And I, I remember in those days, we we were very much thinking, and, and this terminology is still in use today to some degree, because it's clear, um, it helps clarify what's going on. But we use the terms exports and imports, like the you were exporting data from the European Union and importing that data into the United States, of course, metaphorically. And even the idea of a transfer is in some ways old school thinking, right? Because it it it, it just brings to mind that I'm putting stuff into a box, slapping a mailing label on it and, you know, sending it to somewhere. And of course, as we know, as you just described, the way the internet is set up and the way servers work uh, these days with the fiber optic cables and all, all these other uh, forms of uh, of technological transmission that instantly moves data around to wherever it's best, uh, wherever the location that has the best server capacity and is closest to the endpoint or whatever the reason might be, is able to process that data. That all happens instantaneously, often without any conscious decision on the part of the user or even the company having necessarily a great idea of where that data is uh, at any given moment in time. And so we have this this vast network that connects the world, you know, with instantaneous communication, but yet our laws are still thinking of, well, I am, you know, exporting my data from this place to that place. And so what it really brings to, to light is this, uh, the, this conflict that we now see in legal systems and how people think of privacy and data protection, um, where in some places like the European Union, they've taken a very comprehensive approach to uh, protecting people's privacy and, and protecting data. In the U.S., we have a much more, as you know, well know, a sectoral approach that depends on the type of data, as well as a state-by-state -state approach as well, where different states have different privacy laws in place. We don't yet, yet have a comprehensive privacy law. And so it creates this tension and, and these issues that arise when U.S. companies uh, operating in Europe are uh, processing data uh, inside the United States or in a manner that is subject to U.S. government jurisdiction. And I, you know, just to get to uh, quickly the point that um, is is what led is what's led to the current state of affairs between the U.S. and the European on you know, European Union on data transfers 
it's this issue of government access to data uh, for national security purposes. And so uh, just to go through that background real quick. So, so Safe Harbor was in 2000. And as I said, I was at Mary at the time, uh, helped us get into the Safe Harbor uh, as, a, as a global corporation. And then 9-11 um, happened, of course, in 2001. And at that point, I decided that I would go into government. And initially, I joined the CIA's Office of General Counsel um, right after 9-11 or soon after 9-11, stayed there for three years and then joined the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which was this organization that was created as part of the 9-11 reform recommendations to make sure that intelligence agencies were connecting dots, were sharing information, um, were acting, you know, sort of keeping up with the changes of the threat environment and changes in technology and capabilities and risks. And so I was, um, you know, at the Director of National Intelligence as the Civil Liberties Protection Officer uh, for 14 years since the standup of the ODNI and uh, until 2019. I served in that capacity. And one of the major events that happened during that time, there are many major events, but one among the major events was uh, Snowden's disclosures in June of 2013. So that summer was a game changing summer brought into question the legitimacy of the intelligence community and are among the, the concerns that were raised were with our European partners and allies who were very concerned about what they thought was going on based on those disclosures. And um, one of the outcomes of that was uh, President Obama issuing a presidential policy directive, PPD 28, it was called, uh, and it's still called in January 2014. And I was in Brussels, David, at that time speaking at CPDP, uh, the Computer Privacy and Data Protection Conference, which I'm going to next week, by the way, to speak again at. And so I was there speaking on a panel with all these uh, European Commission officials. And thank goodness the, the president signed out that order um, just a week before or even I think it was days before my scheduled talk. So that meant that the talking points I had, I could deliver focusing on the new protections the president had put in place with that presidential policy directive. Then the following year, I mean, that wasn't enough for, for the European uh, Union's legal uh, analysis and reviews because the following year, 2015, uh, the Schrems 1 decision came down. So that was the first Schrems case and that invalidated the safe harbor and told the European Commission to go back to the drawing board I was involved with the subsequent negotiations that led to Privacy Shield. And notice the change in terminology here. We go from a safe harbor, metaphorically, a place where American companies can be in a safe harbor from European regulations to a Privacy Shield, now metaphorically, a shield being held up to fend off uh, American surveillance on data transferred from the European Union. Uh, but the Privacy Shield uh, was also invalidated by the European Court of Justice in July 2020. So, uh, um, and so now we have this new European Union U United States data privacy framework that tries to put in place controls so that it's clear that the government's access to data will be will fit European standards of necessity and proportionality. Those are those their their keywords, as well as redress providing. Uh, complainants some ability to um, have their complaints investigated uh, by an independent body. And, and in order to, uh, to satisfy that concern, um, uh, in, a, in a new executive order, the president created a data protection review court within the Department of Justice with independent outside uh, judges who can only be dismissed for cause. They cannot be dismissed for performance of their duties. Um, to adjudicate complaints that uh, come in from uh, people whose data has been transferred to the U.S. And, and so we hope this this new uh, this new um, uh, court will satisfy the European uh, concerns that there isn't a chance for redress or um, that, you know kind of knock down uh, Trims One and Trims Two because um, I know I think that was a concern of both of them is that there wasn't a way for uh, a European uh, individual to come along and say, hey, why are you looking at my data? You shouldn't be looking at it. And there wasn't a mechanism for that. But getting back to some of these, like um, the ability for government agencies to actually look peak or look at data with a, um, and, and kind of understand what, what's going on and what communications are happening. A lot of that came out of 9-11. And a lot of our audience, we, we, we take this for granted, but it's almost 25 years ago. And so I think um, at the time, I remember 
a lot of people asking, well, gee, how did this happen? How come our agencies weren't communicating more? How did we see the communications to foreign entities that might have indicated that this was going on? And um, I think sometimes that's lost in that discussion of what a shock it was to the country uh, to you know lose that many people, largest terrorist attack since Pearl Harbor uh, on our on our um, in our country, and uh, how you know people came really came to appreciate that there was a need for our agencies to have these additional um, powers, abilities to kind of look in and and uh, get access to this data. I mean, is that your Um, understanding of it, or is that kind of the genesis of a lot of this? Yeah, it's a combination of things. Certainly coming out of 9-11, there was a huge push um, to make sure that that the agencies had the authorities and tools they needed to prevent another terrorist attack. So you're you're absolutely right. And and it is a long time ago. It doesn't seem that long ago for me. Right. Um, but I, something I do in my classes is I ask my students, you know, in the, in a law school to raise their hands. And when I first started teaching, if they remember 9-11 and what they remember about it, and the, the memories are, are getting, you know, shorter and shorter and much more childhood ones about being picked up at kindergarten or whatever on the day in, uh, of 9-11. So, um, so memories, you know, it is it is now less a, a matter of the living memory of people and more a matter of something you read in history class. So I think that's been very interesting to me for, for me to, to see and experience. And of course, if you were in government at the time or, you know, uh, somebody, you uh, you know, a grown up, an adult, it, it is a searing memory. And it was uh, very much a call to action on the part of the, of, uh, the U.S. national security community. And, and one of the relevant, the most relevant things that ultimately came out of that process, there were a lot of fits and starts and, and problems in, in how the U.S. initially reacted from a legal perspective in terms of the Patriot Act and things done outside of um, outside of FISA, uh, called the Terrorist Surveillance Program, you know th these are historical artifacts in, in some for some people now and, and in the living memory of others. But um, ultimately, that led to this authority that is very controversial these days, which is Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Congress recently reauthorized that. Yeah. Um, the 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 issues around that for this past cycle have been around the FBI's ability to conduct queries focusing on U.S. persons. But the core authority um, is one that enables the national security community to, to go to a U.S. company and require that the company under, um, under a, a, a directive supervised by the FISA court uh, provide information about non-U.S. persons, non-Americans, non-legal permanent residents who are located outside the country to obtain foreign intelligence information on you know specific categories of of foreign intelligence that the court has authorized the intelligence community to collect so it's a it's a regulated and restricted and and heavily overseen uh use of authority coming out you know originally emerging from the 911 period uh but now it's used more broadly to focus on for example cybersecurity and cyber attacks as one of the main uh, challenges and concerns the intelligence community is dealing with now. And this ability to look at um, communications for foreign intelligence to protect national security is not unique to the U.S. Everybody, every country in the world has intelligence services that conduct surveillance. Um, so this is not unique to the U.S. And uh, one of the one of the things that I've been involved in over the years has been engaging with our uh, friends and allies in other countries and trying to make sure that there is a common understanding of what it is that a government needs to do to protect its national security and what are some of the challenges that we all face as democracies in trying to do it in a way that doesn't undermine fundamental freedoms uh, of our citizens. And, and it is a challenge because when you think of what a legal framework has to do in the national security space, it has to do two things equally well. It has to authorize and empower agencies to protect the nation, and it has to restrain those agencies from going too far so that they become a threat to the nation, right? So you have to protect the nation from threats without yourself becoming a threat if you're an intelligence agency. And authorizing an agency to protect the nation from threats often means uh, authorizing them to do intrusive things, things that intrude on privacy, things that are getting at information that people aren't freely and openly giving to the government. Um, you have to be able to do intrusive things and you have to be able to do them secretly. So secret 
intrusive techniques are by definition ones that raise a lot of concern and suspicion among uh, democratic uh, people. So, so it's a ch it's a constant challenge, and it's one that we all share. It's not unique to the U.S. experience, and so we all do it differently. Everybody's legal framework is is different. Like you know, uh, even countries within the European Union, something that is not often recognized in a in the, in in public in in a popular set in a popular. Uh, conversation among lay people is that the general data protection regulation and all of the jurisdictional authorities and powers of the European Union as a legal entity by treaty do not apply to the national security activities of the member states. So when you think about GDPR and you think about quote unquote EU law, um, it does not apply to each individual EU member state's national security activities. Those are instead governed by country specific laws now they are they are members of a separate treaty um process a, tr a treaty along with its its institutions under the council of europe it's the european convention of human rights um so that sets certain baseline standards for e eu member states and other members of the council of europe to follow in terms of how they conduct national security but the european union's laws themselves do not apply to member states' national security activities. And yet when we yeah, got into the Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 situations, um, the court said, well, how the US government accesses data from US companies is not an EU national security activity. Therefore, we're going to go ahead and evaluate US, US intelligence agencies' actions and the US legal framework in accordance with what we believe to be EU, EU legal standards which again, themselves do not apply directly to um, the EU member states activities themselves. So, sorry, that's a long answer, but it's a complicated okay. thing. And I teach courses on this, so I yeah. could go on even further. No, no, I think this is very valuable for our audience to kind of have this context as we um, kind of delve a little deeper into, you know, scraping and other types of issues. But um, it seems it seems that uh, I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the scope of the GDPR and it doesn't apply to... Um, intelligence activities within the individual uh, member states. Um, and so they, you know, uh, I think it's important to appreciate that and to understand that, um, um, you know, there may be concerns the other way as well. I mean, depending on how, um, you know, those individual member states uh, use data. But getting back to it, without these types of mechanisms, I guess the country would be at risk to another terrorist attack, another 9-11. Is that... Is that kind of overstating the the need for this for these kind of um, um, capabilities? Yes, um, you know it's not it's not even if you look at the annual threat assessments that the Director of National Intelligence put, publicly puts out, and they and they there's an annual threat hearing that Congress holds where the leaders of uh, the big intelligence agencies all talk about what they see as the threats to the nation. Obviously, terrorism is back. Uh, in the forefront following uh, the events that we've seen overseas. But um, but for years, the the terrorism, when you look at the at the litany of of threats that are in those public reports, terrorism has gone from number one. Now it's a subset of transnational threats, you know, further down and in major uh, big major power competition is really near the top or at the top. So it's Russia and China and um, threats that we've always been or for traditionally been seeing from Iran and North Korea, but really Russia, China, big power competition, um, the techniques that they're using to uh, penetrate our systems, uh, the disinformation uh, campaigns that they run, the, um, you know, so it's, 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 it's a litany of threats, David, is what I'm saying. Yes, terrorism is certainly a big one, and it's a it's a big one in terms of the kinetic threat that that uh, poses, but there are cyber threats as well. And there's also cyber threats in preparation for potential kinetic threats. So there's, you know, what happens if China makes an aggressive move uh, on Taiwan and has penetrated our systems to do damage to our ability to respond in whatever way? Um, that 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 they're that they're seeking to enable. What if um, Russia makes a move against a NATO country, uh, in, invoking the U.S. obligation to to send forces and protect that country, and they have um, 
themselves conducted different cyber activities to undermine the U.S. ability to do so or, you know, with disinformation, et cetera. So these are all tied together these days is sort of where I'm going. And there are a lot of sources of data that, that raise a lot of privacy issues because now the data that the intelligence agencies are seeking to counter these threats and to be able to understand what adversaries are doing and how they may damage the U.S. national security um, are, you know, are, are part, you know, are swimming in data of ordinary people who are of no interest. And there is a danger that if the government is acting in an unrestricted or unrestrained or um, uh, improper or unethical way, that these authorities could be used to undermine democrat democratic processes and values and, and do, do, uh, do things that harm individuals so you have to that's why there's always been this need to do both like how do you give provide access that's necessary to protect national security but also protect individual privacy and freedom it's it's been a conversation we've been having for a long time and and we will continue to be having because there's never a perfect you know a perfect place it's always shifting because the world is always shifting and technology is always shifting I think as you explained, I guess a privacy professional is listening a lot of assurances that, you know, there is a lot of thought that goes into this, but it is extremely complex. Now, we had also talked about scraping as being a data transfer issue. And so I think people don't necessarily think of it that way. But when you appreciate that a lot of the companies that are scraping their business entities or, or sometimes uh, nation states that are doing this, that are not based in the US, they're overseas, and they're moving this data to places where there's no protections, no uh, uh, right for redress, nothing, um, in a sense. And I mean, I, I guess, I don't know if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, how, how based on your knowledge of these various frameworks and, and uh, what the thinking in Europe versus US, but, um, you know, how, how should we be thinking about this as a data transfer issue, as well as just an issue about competition or user privacy. Yeah, it's super. It's super interesting, um, and there are so many issues there. We've, as we've talked about before, David, and your your thoughts are just as valuable as my own on this. But um, <clears throat> I guess there's a couple of things that come immediately to my mind, and one is. Uh, scraping sort of bypasses the whole concept I told you about before, about this idea that there's a company inside the European Union that's gathering data as a part of its business and then is shipping, quote unquote, shipping that data to a processor or to other company facilities or third parties outside of the European Union and has to go through a data transfer mechanism and make sure that the data that it's quote unquote shipping is you know being handled properly and will be protected in the same way that it would be protected essentially the same way as as it is in the European Union. Um, with scraping, you have, as you well know, a company uh, outside of Europe, presumably, um, that is just going in and and grabbing data off of websites and, about Europeans. Um, there is a case uh, by the UK ICO recently, an opinion that came out on. Um, Clearview AI, and it's interesting there because John Edwards, you know, the ICO for the UK, is uh, saying in in that opinion that hey, our, uh, your activities directly are, are subject directly to GDPR under Article Three. So Article Three is the scope provision, and the and the and it's a very broad and expansive scope provision. It basically says GD, GDPR applies in its entirety to companies. Um, who are uh, you know have an establishment in the European Union, which could could include directing their activities at European residents or otherwise monitoring the behavior of EU residents. And so, by scraping data from websites, um, the idea is that the company that's doing the scraping is doing the scraping, obviously to monitor the online behavior or other characteristics of those EU residents, and therefore should be subject to GDPR as a whole without having to go through some kind of data transfer determination. Um, so, you know, there's the, the, the uh, so, so as it relates to the scrapers themselves, I don't see scraping companies, maybe they do, I don't know. Um, I, I need to learn more about, about their own specific practices, but I don't know whether they're the, they're, they view themselves as having the need to enter the data protection, the data privacy framework, for example? Do they have to certify that they subscribe to those principles? Do they have privacy notices where they post and say, yes, we 
we have entered it entered the privacy framework and therefore the FTC would have the ability to enforce um, the FTC Act against them if they made some kind of violation. Um, so uh, I, I don't know whether they would feel the need for that. I, I'm not sure also how their what their position might be if the, if an EU regulator sought to reach out to them and regulate them directly under GDPR as the ICO has done with respect to Clearview for the UK version of it. Um, so those are all interesting and open questions. I think that, so that's one category is I would think of the data scrapers and what their responsibilities are. The other category would be US companies that purchase data from those scrapers. Like, uh, so if the US company is by obtaining data that has been scraped from EU websites is now collecting data on EU residents and, uh, um, you know, and, and has, let's assume they have an establishment, they do business in Europe. So there's not gonna be a jurisdictional issue. Um, would they be viewed to be in violation of their uh, commitments under standard contractual clauses, et cetera, for, for, for the fact that this data may not meet some of those principles or obligations? I assume they would make the argument that the data that they obtained from data scrapers does in fact meet you know, their, their commitments, that they're obviously not violating their commitments. But those are the kinds of issues that come to my mind. And, yeah. then, it, and then, of course, there's the broader issue of the EU approach being so different from the US approach, which we can talk about as well. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I that's a good one. And I have to I pray after this, I'm going to peek over at some of the scrapers uh, websites to see if they have an article 20 GDPR article 27 representative <laughs> listed. Um, because as as all some of our audience may know, is that when you process um, data of European um, citizens or members, you're supposed to have a representative based in, if you're a foreign country, a co company, you're supposed to have a representative based in the EU that can accept process and also be fined. Um, and it's a little bit different than a, a registered agent for service here in the United States where they're just accepting process. And in the EU, they're actually, they actually could levy a fine against that entity that is representing you if you're a foreign company. So that's usually the way um, regulators will try to reach out and say, hey, we know you're doing business here. We know you're processing data of uh, of uh, European uh, EU uh, citizens, but you don't have any Article 27 representative listed in your privacy notice. And so um, a lot of um, a lot of activity around that. And, um, you know, a lot of companies fail to do that. So we'll have to see if uh, any of these scrapers are actually doing that. I suspect not. But um, you know, I guess you know we can we can talk about that. Uh, we can look at that and maybe reconvene at some point in the future and uh, compare notes on that. I, th I think you you brought up a great um, insight on the differences between the way uh, in the U.S. data and user rights are perceived versus Europe. And I've seen this where um, people will try to take aspects of the GDPR and they'll plop them into U.S. law and say this should work, and it causes all sorts of issues. Um, and, and I think sometimes people don't appreciate that there is a difference in the philosophy around data and user rights. And so where in Europe, you might have the right to be forgotten and from search results, and you can get that deleted. In the US, we really don't have that same concept. Uh, there's also the concept of just saying, hey, look, I, I have a right to access correction deletion that, um, that the GDPR gives that in US is a little more fuzzy, or that if I Publish data on the internet in Europe that I still have rights, even if it's public data that somebody just can't come along and do whatever they like with my public information. But in U.S., it's it's kind of different when you look at some of the, how some of the cases are coming out. And uh, I mean, we talked about it a little bit more, but what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's 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 because there is a little is there's a mismatch there, and yeah. and we're trying to harmonize things and facilitate data transfers and stuff, but there really is a difference in philosophy between uh, Europe and, and US and the Brussels effect hasn't quite, it's getting there, but it hasn't quite um, changed that, um, the the view of uh, data protection here in the US as much as it needs to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the way I think of it is, um, um, I think in the US, the, the, the question is how, how can something that's public also be private? because it's public. And so in the the idea that that underlies different aspects of US law, certainly how law enforcement thinks about it and certainly how fourth amendment jurisprudence has developed over time, which is you you know you from a from a fourth amendment perspective um and obviously that only applies to to the government but it it's informative here I think 
you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. That, that, that That's the question. What do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? And if you've posted something on X or published it in the newspaper, you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. You have made that information public and you have assumed the risk that the information will be used, you know, in whatever way it's used. That's on you. You made it public. Well, you know, the, you can see the court, the judges shaking their heads like, well, you shouldn't have done that then, huh? You know, that's that's on you. Um, so uh, the idea is, I think, in the U.S. that once you have set something loose, once you've set it free, it's not going to you can't bring it back, you know. Whereas in Europe, um, I think they have the opposite view, which is that just because I've made it public doesn't mean I still can't control the information. Um, and I think the the way that Europeans would, I'm I'm, I'm generalizing here, and uh, so I apologize for that. This, it, speaking in broadly broad generalizations, yeah. the the idea is that. Um, that you have the right to control how others use information about you. And so if I, and which which fits many definitions of privacy in the US and in Europe, but I'm just trying to simplify here. So if I, if I put something on a website subject to that website's terms and conditions, and um, I, I, my expectation is that it will just be displayed on that website and people will view it in the normal course of using that social media entity, I am not authorizing that entity or any other entity to make other uses of that data. I, yes, it's 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 out there for the public to see, but it's still subject to, I think in US terms would be sort of this invisible click wrap agreement or browse wrap agreement. Like if you're looking at it, you're agreeing, you know, the, the understanding is that you only have the right to look at it in this context and I'm not giving you the right to do it in every other context. It's, it's similar, I think, now that I think about it, just having this thought for the first time, so it may be completely wrong, but it, it's similar to copyright law in the US, right? Like you can make a work of uh, art public, but that doesn't mean that people can copy it or create, make derivative uses of it. So by the same token in Europe, it's like, well, we're making this personal information about ourselves public. That doesn't authorize you to do anything beyond what I have authorized through this website to be done with my personal data. Um, and so that's, that's just a different, a way of thinking about things. Um, I think that uh, I I feel like there's potential for convergence, and we really see that in this in this opinion that you highlighted for me involving X Corp and Bright Data, where where the the judge just just to pivot to that, you know, the judge is bringing in these concepts of copyright law into a private into what we would think of normally as either a privacy issue or um, um, you know unjust enrichment or contract issue bringing in copyright law uh, in a very interesting way. And I'm just thinking, you know, maybe that is the model because uh, for, for public use, because the European way of thinking of this as a privacy issue doesn't resonate in the U.S. because of how we think of privacy as being something that we keep private as opposed to we deliberately put out into the public. Um, and um, um, but if we think of it as, you know, the, the, the other term that I like that's applicable here is data protection, which is, of course, the European term, although they also use the word privacy and there's some subtle distinctions between the two. But um, if we think of it as protecting data, I think that becomes easier for some of our um, our legal doctrines because of this idea that what's public can't be private because it's by definition, it's no longer something that other people don't know about. Um, but nonetheless, we have an obligation to protect the data. We have the obligation to protect users' expectations. We have an obligation to prevent harm and redress harm. So that might be a, a, a more promising way of thinking of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, that's a that's a great insight. I mean, I think it, intellectual property, the the kind of the framework we have here in the U.S. is structured around rewarding inventors and 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 promoting um, uh, what the useful arts, inventions, that kind of thing. And so, like when you think about a, a copyright restriction for seventy years, that's to encourage more copy, you know, more works that are valuable to society. Or when you think about a patent, a limited monopoly. For I think what is it, twenty one years uh, to to uh, okay, well you you get the monopoly, but then afterwards the public gets the benefit of that information, 
Um, and I think about that and I'm like, but, you know, data protection or privacy, um, I don't know that, you know, like in the sense of, well, look, I, I should be able to keep my data private whether or not um, anyone else gets utility out of it at some point in the future. And so maybe you're right in the sense of that. Maybe that's the best way we're going to be able to get this done in the U.S. But um, I, I think when you look at purpose limitations and how the FTC has been enforcing that and saying, look, you only said that, um, I think it was a Twitter or X case where uh, they were trying to, uh, they inadvertently or maybe took telephone data and then use that to do something with their ad tech stack and enhance their ad, uh, you know monetization in that area. And, is, and when they had collected the data, it was originally, uh, they or originally had said, hey, we're only collecting this for purposes of fraud detection. And so there was that purpose limitation there. And so if you look at, you know, getting back to your idea of, well, look, I'm a user, I'm only allowing people to collect data, to view this under a very narrow framework if I'm a user in Europe. That that's kind of there in the U.S. Um, when you look at purpose limitations, but yet the court didn't really see it that way because in that in the um, in the Bright Data case, they were saying, well, gee, you know, X, you you sell the data to uh, you, you know, and this is more of a copyright issue. I mean, it's it seems a little. I mean, they were granted the right to replete and stuff and kind of clean up some of what they did, but uh, I think the court might be struggling with this a little bit too and kind of punted. Um, I don't know if you got that feeling when you read the order. Yeah. Uh, did you want to uh, yeah, let me know, people describe the order for, for the viewers? Yeah. So we can go through it. I mean, I have it here. You know, I'm going to try something really wild. I'm going to actually share the complaint on the screen and we'll see if my computer uh, does something strange or actually lets me do this. We're going to test our technology here. Um, and so I don't know. Can you see the complaint? Yeah. Yeah, and so we had this was filed in, um, and this is great being able to go over with a, a law school professor a actual <laughs> a complaint. That's a, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so um, here, here's the complaint it was filed in November of last year. It, oh, this is the amended complaint, but it's um, uh, and and kind of they go through and what they're saying is that Bright Data is the defendant and they built an illicit data scraping business on the back of innovative technology companies. So that's their position as they go through this, and they kind of go and they and they and they kind of make several claims. It's with, only showing part of the screen now, David. Oh, it is. Oh no. Uh oh, here we go. Let me try again. Is it uh? You got it now or? Yeah, now. Yep. There okay, you go. Sorry about that. Um, and and I think one of the one of the interesting quotes from this is uh, um, at the very beginning, they um they talk about the actual um here on page four. I'll scroll down here. This is a little bit new, but um, they said that they've um, uh, that they've targeting the uh, targeted scraping products in the California market. So they're actually saying, "Look, you can use our scraping tools and scraping data sets to um, to get data from any uh, California business." And so um, that's kind of a little different. It's not just scraping, but they're also they're selling scrape data sets. They're selling scraping tools. And additionally, in this, which is really ironic, they were advertising their scraping data sets and scraping tools. Uh, you see here, they're actually advertising them on, on Twitter or X uh, to the to the <laughs> users there. So you see, this is a um, X post, ready to take the plunge into web scraping. Our latest tutorial covers everything from setting up your developed environment to understanding web pages and developer tools. So step-by-step um, -step guide for web scraping on the site that's being scraped. I mean, that I, I, that kind of takes sauce. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And they, and they put that in the, in the fact section of their complaint, which is very compelling. Um, and so um, they kind of go through um, a lot of the, uh, you know, how they're scraping and where they're making this data available. Then they go through the violation, you know, that the, the, the company has... Uh, um, you know, they've actually uh, signed up. There's several members of the company's team that have uh, clicked on the terms of use and they know that they're users. Um, and, and so that's, um, that's, also, um, that's also an aspect of this complaint. They also talk about how they're selling data sets directly from Twitter. And so they, here it's saying like, tap into Twitter's public accounts with bright data 
data set using filtering capabilities um, to monitor sentiment trends or locate the right influencers. So that implies that there's that these data sets have personal information in them to say it's it's not anonymized. It's you can actually find certain influencers. So I think that's something that people don't realize that, that you know, that's the scope of the scraping activity, which was um, which was quite which was quite big. So then we get to the causes of action, of course, our favorite part. Um, here's lawyers to talk through this and I'll just skip to the bottom. I'm sure it's, uh, as I'm trying to, so the first one, breach of contract, um, the basic, uh, you know, law school one-on-one type stuff, you agree to terms of use and you're violating it. Um, so then they go through and they also have, uh, tortious interference with contract, which is interesting because what they're saying here is look for account holders, um, some of the account holders that are then using the scraping tools, you're encouraging them to violate our, our terms of service or terms of uh, our toss. And so, in other words, if you're a user, they're advertising to Twitter users how to scrape uh, or X users Twitter data. And so that's their that's how that's how they're supporting their uh, tortious interference with contract claim. Um, so then there's unjust enrichment, which is just saying, hey, they're you know using um the data here to uh um you know breach of contract and then they're kind of um uh, selling data that they shouldn't have access to but here's a favorite a law school favorite trespass to chattels and everybody's like what's a chattel um and i'm uh, professor joel what's a chattel I, um I, I mean to me it's just something that is not real property that that somebody else like a book and if i had a book in my backpack i say i was a law student and somebody else took my book they're trespassing my chattel. They're preventing me from using my law school book, my text, perhaps it's Daniel Solov's text or yeah. somebody else, to pass your test, to pass the final exam. Yeah. It was super interesting, that discussion, because the ar argument there was that accessing um, Twitter's or X's servers through these tools that they were using, these scraping tools, was uh, itself a, uh, an, a trespass to chattels. It, it wasn't focused on the scraping aspect in this cause of action, but rather on the access to the to the servers through these unauthorized tools. And um, as we discussed before the call, it, it seemed in some ways to be a problem with the pleading because uh, X did not allege sufficient did not sufficiently allege damage or some actual interference, like you know some diminution in. Uh, processing capacity uh, from use of this tool. And, and in fact, I don't think this judge was inclined to rule in favor of X uh, in any event, but you know, it said that it cited to uh, uh, some references that said that in some ways scraping uses uh, web server capacity more efficiently than a regular browser download would. Um, so um, it it I, I didn't feel like it was inclined to find diminution of use or whatever interference with the actual use of the servers, um, but it did it did say that they had to make that allegation in detail and they had not done so. That's right. Um, yeah, and then, then they go to the fifth cause of action, uh, the fraudulent business practices. That's another one you see in some of these cases, and then just misappropriation, which was. Uh, uh, you know, taking the data and in violation of the terms of use and doing something else with it. Um, so I'm going to jump over to the um, bright bright responses, bright data. Sorry, uh, motion to dismiss, and just to present. Well, how are they arguing? You know, they have they had a lot of arguments against this, but I thought what was interesting is their perspective on scraping, uh, and just to be uh, just to put that out there, uh, what how are they justifying this activity at a high level? And um, I think it's um, this this page 13 here says that, um, you know, that surfing the public web does not interfere with the property right defeats X's remaining tort claim. The Internet is a global communication network. It is founded on and depends on openness and access. Anyone with a server or computer can access the Internet and use it to communicate with everyone else who has done so. That particular server request may be unwelcome, like an unwanted telephone call in the days of yours does not make it illegal. Um, it does not mean there's been a trespass, misappropriation, or unfair use of the communication network. So, I mean, I think that's, I look at that and I'm like, but what about privacy? What about purpose limitation? What about, you know, if I pick up the phone, that doesn't mean that the person is going to pull out all of my conversations for the past week um, that, that I had on that telephone. 
And I think it's a little different, but I mean, I don't know if this caused you kind of made, gave me a little visceral, like, huh, that's, uh, that's not really, that's not really the issue here. Um, well, I think um, so. Um, actually, when I read this, I think this is the this is the issue, right? I mean, it, to some degree, it's exactly what we were talking about earlier, which is that um, the, in the U.S., I think a lot of our legal traditions are that if you if you've made something public, then other people you run the risk that other people will make use of that. Um, and and it, to me, it, sh it, it shows the <clears throat> limitations of our existing legal doctrines to address this concern and that and, and which would which would argue for the establishment of something new. I mean, we've all known for years in the privacy law space that privacy torts just aren't ga gaining the traction that they need. And and ideally, you might think torts really are the way the, the way to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, but that's just not been the way the law has developed through the court system for whatever reason. So we haven't seen these other background or traditional doctrines of law provide an answer. And I think anyone interested in in, in all of that should look at this case because the opinion itself is interesting walking through, you know, very logically, it's well written and well reasoned, um, but, you know, basically not finding uh, any da any significant damages here. Um, finding the pleadings inadequate. And I think um, uh, you know one of the one of the overarching things is is that they they can't find damage. Another overarching thing is that X Corp specifically says to its users that they continue to own all their own data. Um, and I thought that and therefore X Corp itself is not is granted only a non-exclusive license and its ability to limit, how um, data that it has itself a non-exclusive license is used by other entities is very limited under our, our legal system. Well, you have an, it's non-exclusive. Um, so it made me think that the logical, and, and it's interesting because the court highlights why Export does that, which is section 230, as well as the digital Millennium Copyright Act, you know, where where X Corp does not want to itself be liable for the content that users post or for copyright violations or for defamation or anything else that users uh, might do using its system. So it disclaims ownership of that content. But because it did so, it that limits its ability to stop scraping. So I thought that was super interesting, and and um, and the other part of that opinion that I found interesting was that it it said, hey, there's no question that there's a contract here because Bright Data had actual notice of all the terms of use, and was nonetheless continuing to use it. So they they basically found that there was a contract, but they found no damages, and in essence said that to the extent there is a contract claim here under state law. It is preempted by federal copyright law, by Congress's desire um, to enforce these kinds of rights through federal copyright law, um, and uh, and therefore the uh, the ability of um, X Corp to use state contract law is preempted because it would interfere with the purposes of Congress with copyright law. Of course, Congress did not have privacy in mind when it enacted the Copyright uh, Act. So it, that's an interesting uh, part. It, I, I, I found this particular sentence, and I know we're running out of time, but this particular sentence interesting. It said, for example, the Copyright Act should not preempt analogous state law claims asserted by a social media company to protect its users' privacy mm -hmm. because the protection of privacy is not a function of the copyright law, which offers a limited monopoly to encourage ultimate public access to the creative work of the author. It then points out, but X Corp wasn't making this claim on behalf of privacy. It was making That's this right. claim on behalf of its own business interests. So therefore it couldn't make that claim. Now, I, I would imagine that if they replete this, they will go in and make a, make a claim on privacy. But um, then I think we're gonna have other issues of privacy relating to the kinds of things we've been talking about. So to me, this all brings to mind, you know, boy, we, we just need, you know, this is, I would love it if our tort law system were adapting to deal with these new situations but uh, you know it doesn't seem to be <laughs> wow. and so we do need legislative action and who knows you know when and how uh, and what form that will take um but it does seem to me that a company that makes available data um on its website about individuals uh, subject to certain terms and conditions um 
you know, there is a legitimate argument to be made that the company needs some ability to uh, make sure that other companies aren't extracting data, deriving their own value from it in ways that um, were not intended by the user or the company. And I and I guess my final thought there is just just more specifically on this contract issue. Uh, it does bring up the idea of third party beneficiary theory again. Like if if these terms of use expressly made the users third party beneficiaries, I mean I, I'm sure that would create all kinds of other issues. But um, but but then you have the users maybe delegating or assigning their rights under third party beneficiary theory to somebody to pursue on their behalf. Um, that might be an avenue. I don't know. I, now I'm speculating well beyond where I should be. I mean, I mean, no, those are all excellent points. I mean, I think, you know, in Europe, this case would have come out very differently. Oh, yeah. Uh, like nine a day. And I think that's where we were talking about the difference um, where, you know, in America, where car culture and, you know, maybe some generalization there. Um, and, you know, the same thing, the data is free. Once it's out there, it goes wherever. But this was your analogy, actually. But yet, you know, Europe is like more more structured and more like a you know the trains and you can right. go so far with things. And and so and I'm not saying that that informed the privacy um, regime, but it is it is a lot more restrictive in what you could do with an individual's data. And I think, yeah, you know, I mean, I think the U.S. is so so individually oriented. I mean, this is again a broad cultural general, over yeah. generalization, but. Um, is still fun to do every now and then. Yeah, the, what we were talking about was that U.S. the U.S. legal framework strikes me as like you know you get in a car and you can drive and you have to get a license to drive. There are rules of the road, all essentially designed to stop you from harming other people. But otherwise, you can go in your car to wherever you want to go. And we get very annoyed by the idea that we're being tracked, our movements are being tracked because I should be free to go. And with four wheel drive vehicles, you can go off road. Um, but it's it, it, as opposed to a culture where the expectation is you would be taking public transportation almost for almost all of your needs, that might be very efficient and structured, but you wouldn't be able to take the subway car to somewhere that it's not designed to take you. So it would also be more limiting of your individual freedom of movement in some ways. So it's that that's the kind of analogy that I was thinking about different approaches to this where the U.S. is like, hey, you've got an idea, run with it. It's your data. You put it out to the public. That's on you. Um, uh, anyway. But I, th I think this case to me as well indicates like you see a social media company really trying to fight and to say, look, we, we're concerned about they are they're mentioning they're concerned about privacy, they're concerned about a lot of different things in the in the in their pleadings. And um, uh, yet it's so hard with our current framework here in the U.S. for any social media company to really protect their end users uh, from this. And in, in the in the opinion, the court goes out of its way to say, look, it's OK to take protective measures to make it harder for people to scrape. They're OK with that. Yeah. Uh, but that's but that only gets you part of the way. We've had other webinars in this series talking about, well, the harder it is, to, the more measures you take, more captures, more of that kind of thing, uh, the harder it makes the sites for users to use. So who wants to see three or four captions in a row? I mean, it just doesn't work. So um, there's there's a lot there, and um, it'll be interesting. I think they've been given the right to replete this, uh, uh, submit another complaint on, I think, by the 6th, and to see if they try to cure any of the defects. Just you mentioned, like, what are the damages? And they failed to plead damages in a robust way that, you know, they, the court said it was conclusory. Uh, and conclusory means, like, oh, I was damaged because I was damaged. Like, and it just it doesn't work. The court's not going to... Um, do that. So maybe they'll be able to um, kind of replete some of this stuff and get the court to actually move on it. But um, you got to wonder without um, kind of a little bit more ammunition or maybe different regulatory focus uh, that, you know, this is going to, I mean, this is going to be the outcome going forward for a while. Maybe a different court would have a different opinion, but I think a lot of courts look to NDCAL on tech issues to see how they should rule as well across the United States. I don't yes. know if that's your perspective or, um, you know, but I, I can see we're at time here. It's 12 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and again, Professor Joel, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. I think we covered a lot of ground here and uh, always a pleasure. And uh, where are you appearing next? You said you mentioned a conference next week. Yeah, I'll be in Brussels at the computer uh, protection, computer privacy and data protection conference next week, speaking on a digital digital trade and data flows panel. And any students uh, for next semester, what courses are you teaching or do you not know that yet? That they National Security, Surveillance, and Secrecy. 
Excellent. Okay, so everyone um, out there, please sign up for that. Uh, <laughs> and there will be a, a full packed room. Excellent, excellent hour with you, Professor Droll. Thank you so much, and uh, really appreciate the time today. Thank you very much. I really, I really enjoyed it. Take care.